Welcome to the Vinny Vinny Vici Show. I'm Patrick Henry Hansen, and today's topic is an epic issue in sales, but also one of the most misunderstood and least understood issues. For many salespeople, I think today's topic is like a, a riddle inside of an enigma wrapped in a mystery, to quote Churchill. In fact, I would guesstimate that fewer than 10% of sales professionals really understand today's topic. But it's an issue that once understood, or more importantly applied, is one of those skills that really helps separate the good from the great, the high income earners from the average or low income earners, elite sales professionals from mediocre sales representatives, I mean the best from the rest. So what's the issue? Well, let me introduce it with a question. Are buyer pains and problems synonymous? Are buyer pains and problems the same thing? How would you answer that? And if they're not, what is the difference? How would you define each word and does it really even matter? And finally, what on earth would this have to do with the Wizard of Oz? Well, on the surface, these might look like trivial questions or purely semantic issues, but as you're about to see, it's much deeper than that and much more important. Understanding this difference can be the difference between being a high income sales professional and a lower average income sales representative. So let's jump in and answer these questions. Is there a difference between buyer pains and problems? Yes, absolutely. So what exactly is the difference? I mean, what differentiates a buyer pain from a buyer problem? Well, let's start with pain. The first distinction to grasp or understand is that a pain is not a problem. However, a pain is the consequence of a problem. Pain is the consequence of an unfulfilled need or unresolved problem. That makes sense. But here's where it gets a little more complicated, a little more complex. Although to some degree, potential or existing buyer pain is always present, the challenge for salespeople is that it's not always obvious, at least not until it's identified or it's pointed out. Now, once pointed out, it frequently seems obvious, but until it's pointed out, buyer pain usually remains somewhat dormant, hidden in plain sight, camouflaged. Why? Because buyers are perfectly comfortable, totally accustomed to speaking in terms of needs and problems, but not so much about pains. It's just human nature. Pains are a little more raw, a little more tender. Maybe the word is volatile, uncomfortable which is what ironically makes it such a powerful selling tool, but also why ascertaining a buyer's pain requires advanced selling skills and knowledge. Now, one of my favorite quotes from Albert Einstein is that problems cannot be solved at the same level of awareness that created them. Very apropos to our discussion today about buyer pains and problems. Now in B2B sales, there's always more to a problem than meets the eye and Spartan sellers know it. They know, they've been trained, that lurking behind every buyer problem is existing or potential pain. I liken it to an economist reading the book or watching the movie, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. Their expertise in economics allows them to pick up on the deeper meanings and clues, the words, the symbols in the story that the rest of us didn't or don't recognize. I mean, a yellow brick road, a scarecrow, a tin man, a cowardly lion. In the book, she wore magical silver slippers. And a wizard? A wizard of what? A wizard of Oz. But isn't Oz an abbreviation for ounce? A wizard of the ounce? Eh, maybe that seems like a stretch, right? I mean, hundreds of millions of people have seen this movie and read the book. It seems like we would have heard of it by now, right? Well, maybe not. The path to the Wizard of Oz is a yellow brick road. Yellow bricks, really? I mean, surely yellow bricks don't mean gold bars, right? Now keep in mind that this book was written in 1900. And uh, the banks, the big banks used to keep these gold bars in their vaults as a reserve for the American currency. And this was the era of the gold standard. And gold is measured in ounces. Could it really represent the Wizards of Wall Street? The Wizards of the Gold Ounce, abbreviated the Wizard of Oz? 
And if it does, then who or what does the Scarecrow, the Tin Man, and Cowardly Lion represent? Well, let's find out. And then I'll show you what this has to do with buyer pains and problems, and it's going to blow your mind. The wonderful Wizard of Oz has captivated and entertained millions and millions of people in both book and movie format for generations. But very few people realize that the wonderful Wizard of Oz, perceived only as a story to entertain children, wasn't just a fictional work of genius. It was also a critique of the American economic system at the turn of the century in 1900, an economic, political, and financial expose. Well, what exactly was he trying to expose? L. Frank Baum published The Wonderful Wizard of Oz in 1900. It was a, a literary masterpiece that told the story of a young farm girl from Kansas named Dorothy who's knocked unconscious by a cyclone and swept away in a dream that takes her on a journey of self-discovery and adventure. She lands in a community of munchkins and is told to follow the yellow brick road to Emerald City where the Wizard of Oz resides and that he would help her return safely to Kansas. Well, on her journey, she meets a scarecrow, a tin man, a cowardly lion, and along their journey, they're pestered by this wicked witch of the West and her flying monkeys. When she finally meets the wizard, she discovers that he's caught in the same nightmare that she is and that he's a fraud. But miraculously, with the help of a magical pair of silver slippers in the movie, of course, Ruby Red, Dorothy finally makes it home. Now, of course, although interpreted as a story written strictly to entertain kids or children, Baum also wrote it to educate adults. He specifically satirized the monetary debate over the manipulation of the gold standard, and then he satirized the corrupt collusion between big government, big banks, and big business, which in 1900 was considered by many to be one big team. Written as political satire, Baum filled his book with colorful allegorical or metaphorical imagery that exposed the corrupting influence of big government colluding with these big banks and, of course, big business. And they did this to control and manipulate the economy. Man, if <laughs> he thought it was bad in 1900, I can't imagine what he'd think of today's too-big-to-fail bailout philosophy. Or should I say bailout policy using billions of citizen tax dollars to bail out billionaire bankers. I don't know. In Baum's Wizard of Oz expose, everything you read in the book or saw in the movie was symbolic, and I mean everything. It was either allegorical or metaphorical. Dorothy represents the average all-American rural citizen. Even her name had dual meaning as an anagram of Theodore, as in Theodore Roosevelt. The Adore Dorothy. The cyclone that rips her home off the ground and into this tornado, this funnel, that represented the economic storm that was about to knock Americans off their fiscal feet and launch them and their homes and their mortgages into a financial tornado. And the Wicked Witch of the East, who represented big banks and the big business of the East, you know, these are like the international... Bankers of New York, the Wall Street financiers, J.P. Morgan and his pals at the time. They were at risk of being crushed in this coming financial populist storm, which is how the Wicked Witch of the East died when Dorothy, representing American homes mortgaged to those banks, spun out of control, fell out of the sky, and crushed her. I'm actually amazed how many of these parallels are applicable to the 2008 financial crash. The Wicked Witch of the East was wearing these enchanted magical silver slippers when she died. Now in the book, they are silver and not ruby red. And this is significant because the silver slippers end up being the answer to the riddle of how to return home safely. That's because the silver slippers represented silver currency or the power of the banks to mint silver dollars to create additional currency that would, you know, to the populace, magically increase the money supply and combat deflation, which was a serious economic problem at the time. L. Frank Baum was a devoted populist, and there was a huge push by the populace for the federal government to mint interest-free silver currency 
to add silver as an additional metal to the gold standard. Now, the reason the slippers were replaced with ruby red for the movie was because it was the first film that was made in, not color, technicolor. And ruby red apparently sparkled better on screen than silver. Crazy. So the Wicked Witch of the West, representing the big banks and big business of the West, the robber barons, you know, like Rockefeller, when she attempts to take her sister's enchanted slippers, they give her a shock and then magically appear on the feet of Dorothy, symbolizing power being transferred from the evil big banks and returning to the American people to print interest-free money. Of course, the banks charge interest when they print our money. Well, Dorothy asks how to get back home to Kansas and is told by the munchkins the wizard would know. She'd have to travel to Emerald City, which represents Washington, D.C., visit the Emerald Palace, the White House, and meet with the wonderful Wizard of Oz, who would know how to get her home to Kansas. When she asks how to get to Emerald City, the Munchkins, of course, tell her, follow the yellow brick road. The Munchkins were the sheeple. They represented the simple-minded citizens, easily manipulated with superstition and basically being taught to be good little conformists. The Lollipop Guild, with their terrific tough guy stance and song represented, of course, unions. We represent the Lollipop Guild, the Lollipop Guild, the Lollipop Guild, the ling a ling oh, the Lollipop Guild. We wish to welcome you to Munchkin Land. The Yellow Brick Road represented the gold standard. Our monetary system at the time, when gold bars were used as financial backing for our, our currency. You know, you used to be able to take your greenbacks to a bank and exchange them for either gold or more likely gold certificates. The currency was backed by actual gold called fractional reserve banking, which we still use today. We just replaced gold with cash or debt. The amount of currency was always based on a percentage of actual gold that was sitting in the vaults of these big banks. So the volume of currency always correlated with the volume of gold reserves. That's the gold standard, the fractional percentage of gold in the vaults to back it. This was, of course, before the Fed legally but duplicitously clandestinely usurped that power in 1913. On her journey, Dorothy meets a scarecrow, a tin man, and a cowardly lion. The scarecrow represents agriculture, the American farmer, considered by Eastern elites as unsophisticated, backwoods, illiterate, brainless simpletons. But as the story depicts, the scarecrow, the American farmer, was actually the one with the most brains and who conjured up the most common sense solutions on their journey. The tin man represented manufacturing, and the American industrial worker who was hit hardest by the economic downturn, unemployed, immobile, rusting. He was part of the 18% of Americans who were unemployed at the time, 18%, unable to find work and who had lost heart. It's also interesting to note that as a symbol of manufacturing, the entire industry was frozen without the use of what? Oil. Rockefeller's monopoly at the time, standard oil. Nobody could move or function without it. The Cowardly Lion represented politicians full of false bravado, the William Jennings Bryans of the day, who roared like lions on the campaign trail, but cowered like kittens when push came to shove, blustering, bloviating, all bark and no bite. Toto represents the teetotalers and the prohibition movement, always tagging along and stirring up trouble behind the populist movement. On their journey, they're pestered by the Wicked Witch of the West, representing big banks and big business, and her little slave monkeys, representing child labor, which was still legal at the time, and working for a lot of the big businesses. When they finally see Emerald City, it's surrounded by a field of flowers, and as they run toward the city, they feel drugged and fall asleep. That's because those flowers represented poppy fields, the global opiate epidemic that peaked, ironically, in 1900. 
Well, they needed to be awakened. And so like manna from heaven, a mysterious white powder falls from the sky that counters the effects of the opiates, and it wasn't snow. That white powder represented the latest miracle drug of the day, cocaine, a relatively new drug that was sweeping the world at the time and was even an, an ingredient in the original Coca-Cola. Once in Emerald City, the people were ruled by the Wizard of Oz. Everyone was forced to wear green colored glasses with gold frames. In other words, they were required to see the world through the lens of money and in the color of money, greenbacks. Like the projected scary face of the wizard, the face of the Wicked Witch of the West, and the faces of her winky palace guards, all had green faces and represented the faces of greed and money. Ironically, Dorothy accidentally ends up killing the Wicked Witch of the West with liquidity, water. An inter interesting note as well is that all three of Baum's color themes surround money, green, gold, and silver. And finally, the symbol you've probably been waiting for, Baum's allegorical finale, the Wizard of Oz himself, who naturally living in the Emerald Palace, the White House, in Emerald City, Washington, D.C., the wizard represents the President of the United States of America, the man behind the curtain, the power behind the scenes pulling the strings, but who, it turns out, is a pawn, a fraud, distracting and misleading the people and living a lie, a puppet ultimately bought and paid for by the global financial tycoons of the day, the Rothschilds and their web of banking elites from London, the Rockefellers, the Carnegies, the Vanderbilts, the DuPonts, and J.P. Morgan. They figured out a very simple truth, that to control a gold standard monetary system, you simply need to control the gold ounce, which leads to our final and most important symbol of the entire story. The abbreviation for ounce, of course, is Oz. Control the ounce, and you control the wizard the wizard of the gold ounce, the wonderful wizard of Oz. L. Frank Baum's allegorical tale was a clandestine effort to expose a select group of international financiers, Wall Street titans, uh, politicians, and, and show them as what they were, frauds and crooks. His book was damn near prophetic. Just 13 years after its publication, those same financial masters controlling the wizard and the gold ounce, <coughs> excuse me, further consolidated their power, their stranglehold, stranglehold over the U.S. economy, and ergo the world economy, with the formation of an unelected, largely unaccountable private bank that has paid interest for the privilege of creating and printing our nation's currency and controlling the value thereof. I'm speaking, of course, of the Fed, the Federal Reserve, which is neither federal nor a reserve and who figured out, like they did with the gold ounce, that to control an economy, you simply need to control its currency, making the Fed, not Congress, the most powerful institution in the world, and making the Fed chairman the most powerful man in the world, not the president of the United States. He's just a wizard. And don't think this is some kooky conspiracy theory. It's right out in the open if you have eyes to see and ears to hear. In fact, you see it in every transaction you make. Look no further than the dollar bill in your wallet or purse. Look closely and you will see how each of us is still wearing gold rim glasses, seeing the color green, the color of Federal Reserve notes, the color of our currency. The Wonderful Wizard of Oz is truly a literary masterpiece and read correctly is the most illuminating political satire and economic expose ever written. And now that it's been pointed out, isn't it obvious? A yellow brick road? A wizard of Oz? Silver slippers? A scarecrow? A tin man? I first learned about this from a book I read almost 20 years ago. It was a book called The History of Money. And when I read this section on the wonderful Wizard of Oz, I felt almost sheepish, stupid, like I hadn't made the connection on my own. It seemed so obvious. But the fact remains, until someone else pointed it out to me, it remained entirely camouflaged. 
Now, it's similar to a skilled and alert economist reading The Wizard of Oz. A skilled and alert seller, a Spartan seller, recognizes the deeper meanings and issues involved in a sale. They don't just skim the surface. They don't just hope kind of maybe sort of on a good day with a downhill wind that you know the buyer will reveal their pain. Instead, they skillfully pull back the curtain. They attempt to ascertain the sometimes veiled, subtle, or even hidden consequences of the problems their clients face, the pain. And it takes a certain awareness, a certain skill, a certain type of question to ferret out that pain, to ascertain the pain. A category of probes that we call ascertain pain questions. Now, ascertain pain questions are step three in the DNA selling method seen here on your, on your screen. After D or discovery questions, identify a buyer's circumstance, account facts, and qualification factors. And then N for need problem questions, those identify buyer's needs and problems. You then have the third category, ascertain pain questions, and these explore any existing or potential pain linked to the need or the problem. Now keep in mind, pain is always the consequence of a problem, always. You can never have pain without first having a problem. Now this is why Spartan sellers, unlike 99% of their competitors and non-Spartan colleagues, they don't stop their investigating efforts once they identify a buyer's needs or problems. Unlike traditional sellers, Spartan sellers take it to the next level, and they do that with ascertained pain questions. These questions help spotlight any existing or potential pain linked to the need or problem. They highlight the negative consequences of an unfulfilled need or unresolved problem, i.e. the pain. So let's define our terms a little deeper. Traditionally, Salespeople use problems and pain synonymously. You frequently hear salespeople, for example, talk about uh, a buyer's pain points, when really what they're talking about is a buyer's problems, not pains. So what's the difference and why does this matter? Going all the way back to the beginning of this video. Well, let's dive in a little deeper into that difference and then discuss why it matters and what it can do for you. So my neighbor has a huge basement and years ago went on a week-long family vacation in summer and when he came home he found almost a foot of water in his basement. And it turned out that he had a sprinkler system that had a pipe that just snapped. It broke and just drained into his basement 24-7 for almost an entire week. He had to pump all the water out, destroyed his carpet, all of his basement furniture was wrecked, wrecked his walls, his framing, his sheetrock. He was a genealogy freak and it wrecked all of his genealogy work and family history and pictures he had in boxes on the floor in his basement. I mean, it was horrible because the water had been in there for more than three days. He had to worry about black mold. I mean, it didn't just destroy his basement. It destroyed him. He had to tear out everything and basically rebuild it from scratch. It took him almost six months to finish rebuilding that basement. Now, what was the problem? What was the problem? A broken pipe. And what was the pain? All the not negative consequences of the problem. I mean, that's why pains and problems are not synonymous. Pain is always the consequence of a problem. I'd say 90% of sales trainers, sales books, sales training programs, teach a sales model that I call Pavlovian sales. It's a model that teaches sellers that once they've identified a buyer need they can fill or a problem that they can solve to present their solution. The buyer rings a bell and the seller starts drooling demos and salivating solutions all over the buyer. Now in fairness, Pavlovian selling isn't a bad way to sell. It's just never the best way to sell. It's how average sellers sell. It's not how Spartan sellers sell. After unearthing buyer needs and problems, average sellers immediately jump to the presentation stage of the sales cycle. Unfortunately, this Pavlovian approach bypasses a golden sales opportunity, an opportunity to develop needs and problems into pains. You see, pain is the ultimate PBM, primary buying motive. And it's the ultimate PBM because pain is the most motivating factor known to mankind. 
People will act faster and spend more money to prevent or eliminate pain than any other factor in life. Pain is a seller's yellow brick road that leads straight to Emerald City, baby. In other words, after a need or a problem's been identified, Spartan sellers don't rush in with a presentation. They don't start drooling demos or pitching products or salivating solutions. Instead, they ask ascertained pain questions to smoke out any potential or existing pain that's linked to the problem. In our trainings, we offer dozens of potential ascertained pain questions to choose from. It's like a, a library of samples. So for today, let me just give you a Cliff Notes version and give you a feel and a flavor for the purpose and more importantly, the power of ascertained pain questions. So after a buyer has communicated a need or a problem that I can solve, rather than jump in with my solution, I want to build what we call S3, the size, scope, and severity. Size, scope, and severity of the need or the problem. By building S3, I help make an existing need or problem larger, more significant, and more urgent. Now keep in mind, by building the size, scope, and severity of a need or a problem, I'm simultaneously building the size, scope, and significance of my solution. This is why asking ascertained pain questions prior to introducing the solution that will solve it is such a, a Spartan strategy. It's cerebral. The buyer's pain acts as a foil or a contrast to my solution, which enhances my value, the appeal, and the importance. So you see, when you build your buyer's pain, you are simultaneously building your solution's value. Now, after I read a book called 212 Degrees, you probably heard of it, it's a really brief kind of a motivational book, I started to call ascertained pain questions 212 probes. So at 211 degrees, water is really, really hot. But at 212 degrees, water boils. That extra degree is the difference between water being still basically lifeless and energyless, and water literally coming to life, exploding with energy. Well, similar to the 212 principle, buyer problems are hot, but buyer pains are boiling. Think of a buyer's problem like a cut on an arm, and think of an ascertained pain question as rubbing alcohol that you pour in the cut. I mean, it immediately injects the problem with some life and gives them a little sting, a little venom, a little inertia. It gives it some energy. It grows the 211 degree problem into a 212 degree pain. Now, I hope you enjoyed today's program, uncovering the mysterious monetary message behind the Wizard of Oz and using ascertained pain questions to unmask the sometimes camouflaged pain lurking behind the curtain. By the way, if you ever want to be the most interesting man in the world, or perhaps the smartest person in the room. This Wizard of Oz story is a good one to have tucked away in your back pocket. <laughs> and you'll look especially brilliant if alcohol's involved, same. In conclusion, let me leave you with a, a gem. A realization that I had uh, early in my career that had a very profound impact on my thinking. It basically was this. If you wanna make big money, solve big problems. Keep in mind that every big problem was once small. Be sure to join us on our next edition of the Vini Vidi Vici Show where I take the mystery out of history and in another epic historical story, I will show you why and how it actually relates to your career and income. To my fellow business and sales warriors, drive fast, take chances, and never forget that business is war, sales is the battlefield. Be Spartan.